So, when last we left uh, Boswell writing about the life of Johnson, Johnson was in the Library of the King having a nice little discussion with the King. His Majesty inquired if he was then writing anything. Johnson answered he was not, for he had pretty well told the world what he knew, and must now read to acquire more knowledge. The king, as it should seem, with a view to urge him to rely on his own stories, stores as an original writer, and to continue his labors, then said, I do not think you borrow much from anybody. Johnson said, he thought he had already done his part as a writer. I should have thought so too, said the king, if you had not written so well. Johnson observed to me upon this that no man could have paid a handsomer compliment, and it was fit for a king to pay. It was decisive. When asked by another friend at Sir Joshua Reynolds's whether he made any reply to this high compliment, Johnson answered, No, sir, when the king has said it, it was to be so. It was not for me to bandy civilities with my sovereign. Perhaps no man who has spent his whole life in courts, could have shown a more nice and dignified sense of true politeness than Johnson did in this instance. His Majesty, having observed to him that he supposed he must have read a great deal, Johnson answered that he thought more than he read, that he had read a great deal in the early part of his life, but having fallen into ill health, he had not been able to read much compared with others. For instance, he said, he had not read much compared with Dr. Warburton. Upon which the king said that he heard Dr. Warburton was a man of such general knowledge that you could scarce talk with him on any subject on which he was not qualified to speak, and that his learning resembled Garrick's acting in its universality. A footnote here. The Reverend... Mr. Strahan clearly recollects having been told by Johnson that the king observed that Pope made Warburton a bishop. True, sir, said Johnson, but Warburton did not did more for the Pope. He made him a Christian, alluding no doubt to his ingenious comments on the essays on man. Back to the uh, majesty. His majesty then talked of the controversy between Warburton and Loth which he seemed to have read, and asked Johnson what he thought of it. Johnson answered, Warburton has most general, most scholastic learning. Loth is the more correct scholar. I do not know which of them calls names best. Hmm. The king was pleased to say he was at the same opinion, adding, You do not think, then, Dr. Johnson, that there was much argument in the case. Johnson said he did not think there was. Why, truly, said the king, when once it comes to calling names, argument is pretty well at an end. His, his majesty then asked him what he thought of Lord Littleton's history, which was then just published. Johnson said he thought his style pretty good, but that he had blamed Henry II rather too much. Why, said the king, they seldom do these things by halves. No, sir, answered Johnson, not to kings. But fearing to be misunderstood, he proceeded to explain himself, and immediately subjoined, that for those who spoke worse of kings than they deserved, he could find no excuse, but that he could more easily conceive how some might speak better of them than they deserved, without any ill intention. For as kings had much in their power to give, those who were favored by them would frequently, from gratitude, exaggerate their praises. And as this proceeded from a good motive, it was certainly excusable, as far as error could be excusable. The king then asked him what he thought of Dr. Hill. Johnson answered that he was an ingenious man, but had no veracity, and immediately mentioned, as an instance of it, an assertion of that writer that he had seen objects magnified to a much greater degree by using three or four microscopes at a time than by using one. Now, added Johnson, everyone acquainted with microscopes knows that the more of them he looks through, the less the object will appear. 
Why, replied the king, this is not only telling an untruth, but telling it clumsily. For, if that be the case, everyone who took, who can look through a microscope will be able to detect him. I now, said Johnson to his friends, when relating what had passed, began to consider what I that I was depreciating this man in the estimation of his sovereign, and thought it was time for me to say something that might be more favorable. He added, therefore, that Dr. Hill was, notwithstanding, a very curious observer, and if he would have been contented to tell the world no more than he knew, he might have been a very considerable man, and needed not to have recourse to such mean expedients to raise his reputation. Here's where I'd like a little footnote about Dr. Hill, because I have no idea who this is or what he did. Something about microscopes. That's all I got. The king then talked of literary journals, mentioning particularly the Journal des Savants, and asked Johnson if it was well done. Johnson said it was formally very well done, and gave some account of the persons who began it, and carried it on for some years, enlarging at the same time on the nature and use of such works. The king asked him if it was well done now. Johnson answered he had no reason to think that it was. The king then asked him if there were any other literary journals published in this kingdom except the monthly and critical reviews. And on being answered that there were no other, his majesty asked which of them was the best. Johnson answered that the monthly review was done with more care, the critical upon the best principles, adding that the authors of the monthly review were enemies to the church. This the king said he was sorry to hear. The conversation next turned on the philosophical transactions when Johnson observed that they had now a better method of arranging their materials than formerly. Aye, said the king, they were obliged to Dr. Johnson for that. For his majesty had heard and remembered the circumstance which Johnson himself had forgot. In fact, I forgot. I don't know what he's talking about. He's done so much, you know, it's hard to keep track. His Majesty expressed a desire to have the literary biography of this country ably executed and proposed to Dr. Johnson to undertake it. Johnson signified his readiness to comply with His Majesty's wishes. During the whole of this interview, Johnson talked to His Majesty with profound respect but still in his firm, manly manner, with a sonorous voice, and never in that subdued tone which is commonly used at the levee and in the drawing room. After the king withdrew, Johnson showed himself highly pleased with his majesty's conversation and gracious behavior. He said to Mr. Bernard, Sir, they may talk of the king as they will, but he is the finest gentleman I have ever seen. And he afterwards observed to Mr. Langton, Sir, his manners are those of as fine a gentleman as we may suppose Louis the Fourteenth or Charles the Second. At Sir Joshua Reynolds's, where a circle of Johnson's friends was collected round him to hear his account of this memorable conversation, Circle of Johnson. I'm not going to go there. Dr. Johnson, Ward, Dr. Joseph Warden, in his frank and lively manner, was very active in pressing him to mention the particulars. Come now, sir, this is an interesting matter. No, do favor us with it. Johnson, with good, great humor, complied. He told them, I found his majesty wished I should talk, and I made it my business to talk. I find it does a man good to be talked to to by his sovereign. In the first place, a man cannot be in a passing passion. Here some question interrupted him, which is to be regretted, as he certainly would have pointed out and illustrated many circumstances of advantage from being in a situation where the powers of the mind are at once excited to vigorous exertion and tempered by reverential awe. During all the times in which Dr. Johnson was employed in relating to the circle at Sir Joshua Reynolds's, the particulars of what passed between the king and him. 
Dr. Goldsmith remained unmoved upon a sofa at some distance, affecting not join in the least in the eager curiosity of the company. He assigned as a reason for his gloom the in seeming inattention that he apprehended Johnson had relinquished his purpose of furnishing him with a prologue to his play, with the hopes of which he had been flattered. But it was strongly suspected that he was fretting with chagrin and envy at the singular honor Dr. Johnson had lately enjoyed. At length, the frankness and simplicity of his natural character prevailed. He sprung from the sofa, advanced to Joseph uh, Johnson, rather, and in a kind of flutter from imagining himself in the situation which he had just been hearing described, exclaimed, Well, you acquitted yourself in this conversation better than I should have done, for I should have bowed and stammered through the whole of it. It's interesting how they uh, uh, spell sofa here. It's S-O-P-H-A, sofa, like sophisticated sofa. Anyway. I, Boswell, received no letter from Johnson this whole year, nor have I discovered any of the correspondence he had, except the two letters to Dr. Mr. Drummond, which have been inserted for the sake of connection with that of the same gentleman in 1766. It is proper here to mention that, when I spoke of his correspondence, I consider it independent of the voluminous collections of letters which, in the course of many years, he wrote to Mrs. Thrale, which forms a separate part of his works. And as a proof of the high estimation set on any right anything which came from his pen, was sold by the lady for the sum of five hundred pounds. Johnson's diary affords no light as to his employment at this time. He passed three months at Lichtfield, and I cannot omit an affecting and solemn scene there, as related by himself. And now we have a quote from, I believe, Johnson's diary. Sunday, October 18th, 1767. Yesterday, October 17th, at about ten in the morning, I took my leave forever of my dear old friend, Catherine Chambers, who came to live with my mother about 1724, and had but, but little parted from us since. She buried my father, my brother, and my mother. She is now 58 years old. I desired all to withdraw, that I then told her that we were to part forever, that at Christ, as Christians we should part with prayer, and that I would, if she was willing, say a short prayer beside her. She expressed great desire to hear me, and held up her poor hands as she lay in bed with great fervor, while I prayed, kneeling by her, kneely in the following words. Almighty and most merciful Father, whose loving kindness is over all thy works, behold, visit, and relieve this my, thy servant, who is grieved with sickness. Grant that the sense of her weakness may add strength to her faith, and seriousness to her repentance. And grant that by the help of the Holy Spirit, after the pains and labors of this short life, we may all obtain every lasting happiness, through Jesus Christ our Lord, for whose sake hear our prayers. Amen, our Father, and etc. I then kissed her. She told me that to part was the greatest pain that she had ever felt, and that she hoped we should meet again in a better place. I expressed with swelled eyes and great emotion of tenderness the same hopes. We kissed and parted. I humbly hope to meet again and to part no more. That's from Johnson's Prayers and Meditations, page 77 and 78. By those who have been taught to look upon Johnson as a man of a harsh and stern character, let this tender and affectionate saying be candidly read, and let them then judge whether more warmth of heart and grateful kindness is often found in human nature. We have the following notice in his devo devotional record. August 2nd, 1767. I have been disturbed and unsettled for a long time, and have been without resolution to apply to study or to business, being hindered by sudden snatches. Uh, footnote here. Ib, page 73, August, on August 17, he recorded, 
By abstinence, abstinence from wine and su suppers, I obtained sudden and great relief, and have freedom of mind restored to me, which I have wanted for all this year without being able to find any means of obtaining it. Johnson, however, furnished Mr. Adams with a dedication to the king of that ingenious gentleman's treatise on the globes, conceived and expressed in such a manner as could not fail to be very grateful to a monarch, distinguished for his love of the sciences. This year was published the ridicule of his style under the title of Lexiphanus. Sir Joseph John Hawkins ascribes it to Dr. Kenrick, but its author was one Campbell, a Scotch purser in the Navy. The ridicule consisted in implying Johnson's words of large meaning to insignificant matters, as if one should put the armor of Goliath upon a dwarf. The contrast might be laughable, but the dignity of the armor must remain the same in all considerate minds. This malicious drollery, therefore, as may easily be supposed, could do no harm to its illustrious object. We have here only the chance of vacancies in the passing carriages, and I have bespoken one that may, if it happens, bring me to town on the 14th of this month, but this is not certain. I'm sorry, I missed something at the bottom here. Forget that last thing I said. I, I was a little confused there. So, malicious drolly, therefore, may easily be supposed, could do no harm to its illustrious subject. Pause. Another letter. To Bennett Langton, Esquire, at Mr. Rothwell's perf Perfumer in New Bond Street, London. Dear Sir, that you have been all summer in London is one more reason for which I regret my long stay in the country. I hope that you will not leave the town before my return. We have here only the chance of vacancies in the passing carriages, and I have bespoken one that may, if it happens, bring me to town on the 14th of this month, but this is not certain. It will be a favor if you communicate this to Mrs. Williams. I long to see all my friends. I am, dear sir... Your most humble servant, Lichtfield, August, uh, October 10th, 1767, Sam Johnson. And now, though I'm a little bit uh, early, I think I'll stop, because the next part will begin with 1768, when Johnson is 59, catching up in the years. Anyway, till next time, bye from Boswell.